just going to read it because Kevin, as well as being uh, a fabulous intensive care doctor, is also currently working for NHS England in uh, trying to look at, trying to, and I heard him say this this morning, he'll tell us a little bit more, trying to put a practice and theory together because clearly Kevin has works in ITU. He also uh, is one of those folk that, that goes around in the air ambulances, but he's taking the, the what he's learning working in ITU at UCLH to policy and practice to make sure that what's being put in place for ITU staff, and that's nurses, doctors and, and, and whoever, actually meets the needs of staff and isn't something that people have just done uh, on the back of an envelope, so to speak. And finally, before I start to in, start to talk to Kevin and ask him questions, as many of you know, a few weeks ago, he produced a spectacular paper with other researchers, including Neil Greenberg, on the rates of mental illness at King's College ITU staff, which had uh, quite a, 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 a really quite a, a, a worrying level of post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'm going to talk to Kevin now and just from a perspective, Kevin, of your work in intensive care. Now, clearly you've been doing both during this pandemic. You've been working at, at UCL, UCLH, but you've also been traveling around the whole country and you've also been uh, working with the government. And it'd be great for the next half an hour till about uh, well, really quarter to six, and then we'll, we'll pick up questions as they go along. But what, what's, I mean, what's your sense of ITU staff? What, what's, what's the, the feeling that you're picking up from, from your own work, from also from that of others? So I, um, hmm, it has been an interesting year for me. So about a year ago now, I was seconded into NHS England uh, from, from my job at UCLH. So I'm duly credited in anaesthesia and intensive care. And these days, actually, I do much more intensive care than uh, more, more, much more anaesthesia than anything else but 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 um i got seconded out and was working uh it really w helping w with sort of strategic response um but i then realized that i probably had to get into the units and have a look at themselves not just my own other units and so you know i've spent quite a lot of the last year visiting units in some of the you know hardest surged areas and wherever you go, it is the same. I mean, this has not been an easy thing to accommodate. I mean, in fact, the exact opposite. And and the more I spoke to the people, the more the themes emerged, you know, commonly about how hard people had found it and how 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 well they had responded to the challenge, but also what that had cost them. And I think that that was then what led me to begin to run the surveys um, uh, of well-being because in the end there were there were beginning to be lots of anecdotes about well the staff are tired and the staff are fatigued but i thought you know they, they, those they're more than tired mm -hmm. they're more than fatigued and actually if we don't start measuring this no one will be able to manage it and so we ran these surveys and they were pretty revealing so um, uh, I, I, you know, as I've spent time working in the units and visiting the units, you know, there isn't anyone in any part of this incident who hasn't been deeply affected by it. But affected is not the right word. You know, there is injury as well, and we need to think about that. And it gives us pause for thought about, you know, the wider organisation of our health service, not not just during COVID, but before COVID and after COVID. Absolutely. And those, by the way, who's listening, please put any comments in the in the in the Q and A box. Is it the Q and A box rather than no, in the chat box, and we'll pick those up as we go along. And yes, you are all muted. Can we go back a bit though, Kevin? Can we just go back to the start of this pandemic? Because ITU staff, of course, uh, in particular in London, were first off the block because uh, we were seeing a lot of cases in London, and there was a lot of change that happened in intensive care at that time and i was hearing stories from running the service i ran for sick doctors that that certainly at the beginning of the pandemic there was a, a new sense of purpose a, a sort of slight exhilaration amongst intensive care staffers and supports were being put in place so uh, maybe not physical uh, hugging but certainly metaphorical hugging and decompression rooms and things like that and there was probably a slight improvement in mental health. I mean, is that your experience or is that something from one step back I, I sort of fantasize about? No, I think 
that's probably true, or at least there's, there's certainly the perception of an improvement in mood, partly because you get this thing that is, brings people together like almost nothing else can, you know, this sense of singular purpose, not just across you and your colleagues, but across the whole, not even just across the whole hospital, but the whole health service, you know, you've never felt it like that before. And, and so I think that there is a period for which, you know, that, that people respond in a very positive way. And, and I, 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 I've come across this before because, you know, I've been in London long enough now to have responded to several of the major incidents. And indeed, the first major incident I was part of was in 1999 after the bombing of Soho, the nail bombing of Soho. And, and after that, I had a lot of very mixed emotions about it. But in the end, I realized that something could be at the same time quite professionally rewarding and quite emotionally difficult at the same time. And those things you sort of have to kind of separate, really. Mm. But I think you're right. I think at the start, when the adrenaline's up for a short period of time, I don't want to say uh, it's, exhilaration is not the right word, but certainly there's an energy that comes with that, that, that because it provides cohesion, because it bonds you to your colleagues more closely, I think it does help. It certainly helps in that early phase. But I'm assuming, Kevin, that that was, if anything, short-lived, because what was apparent at the beginning of the pandemic were, were, was the lack of physical uh, safety, in particular PPE, and let alone psychological safety. And I imagine many of the staff, as we came out of maybe the first few weeks, were beginning to feel very anxious about getting it themselves and as you say were absolutely exhausted is that again something that that you were, were finding in your in your uh, in your own work so so i think what what was difficult about the opening volley of this whole thing is the deep and dense uncertainty of it and um and you know we're used to that to a degree aren't we i in fact i think what i came to realize was that that clinicians as a profession you know our 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 professional superpower is decisions in the face of uncertainty isn't it and and uh, uh, but but this was deep uncertainty and nowhere really to look for the right advice nowhere really to look for assurance of how best to practice or no protocols no guidelines really that were fully in place um, and, and, you know, for that period, I, I was actually away from the frontline units quite a lot because I, I was mostly uh, at, at Skipton House. But, but, but you know, I, I, th I think that that was difficult. Um, I think that in, in that phase, so much was unknown and so much we were still adapting the response. So we hadn't got into any rhythm of anything. And, and I, I think that's, that's deep difficult for any organization let alone an individual and and of course in intensive care staff had to contend with not just the increased volume and this is again london because if we remember many people were prepared outside london but the, the patients weren't coming but in london were having new teams new people coming in they were having to change the way they work they were maybe having to look after many more patients than they were normally the uh, people uh, people trained not to the same level were coming into intensive care. How do you think that affected the morale and, and, and mental well-being of staff? So I think people can do different. Um, and, and I think that what actually we saw was, you know, if, if you abstract yourself, what this is, is, is this beautiful sort of pluripotent service that is capable of everything to dealing with ingrowing toenails all, all, all the way up to you know uh, organ transplants turn itself over to something much simpler and much uglier which is you know effectively turning itself over as an entire health system towards this thing of acute secondary medical care and and and, and critical care really to the exclusion of so much else. And I think that's difficult. I think that's difficult for all of us. And um, I think then what was most difficult and what is always difficult is watching this thing coming and being uncertain of whether or not, when, what's gonna reach its limit first, you know, you or it. And, and, and you know, again, it's hard for us now to think back 12 months, isn't it? Uh, but, but that lack of certainty, you know, it is difficult. And, and any, even when you're in the tightest spots, 
or at least in my day job, if the tightest spots, you have the sense that someone's coming and something's coming and you won't reach the bottom of the well. And, and if you can hold the line for just a bit longer, something will turn up. Whereas I guess for a lot of COVID, there was a sense that, will we reach the end of the rope? Mm. And I'm glad happens, we're talking in the past tense because of course it's still going on, but my overwhelming image of these wonderful ITU staff was them having not just to deal with the, the workload and the intensity, but doing it basically in plastic bags for a whole day. And that must have been exhausting to be wearing PPE to the, just even moving around. I mean, it, I, I'm assuming that that was exhausting looking at it from the outside. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think that this incident eroded almost all of the pillars of your basic hierarchies of need, didn't it? I mean, you know, yes. you were there suddenly strapping stuff to your face, leaving big welts in the side of your face. You know, you're barely able to communicate in any way with anyone, let alone have a civil chit chat with them. Uh, it's hot, it's uncomfortable. You sit there worried about your safety. Uh, that, that, that is what this thing is, but it's persistently during the days. And then your break times, your break times, there's something taken away from those because you have to be distancing to some degree or wearing a mask and or wearing a mask. And, and so all of those things, those basic things that give you comfort in a busy day, uh, you know, and then the things that you fall back to outside of that are all stripped away. And so all you're left with is this pretty ugly central core of work, which is, you know, the thing that you're doing without any of the, you know, wh why do we enjoy going to work? Well, it is the professional attainment uh, associated with it but there is a large part that is the social support and the network and the camaraderie yeah. of being around people and all of that suddenly disappeared you know absolutely and again all of you in intensive care the whole nhs of course has, has as you said has, has has pulled together but intensive care was the epicenter if we call it of this war uh, having to deal with some of the most seriously ill patients and we, t we hear a lot about moral injury, moral distress. I'm assuming that in intensive care, I mean, you know, don't talk about the, uh, you can talk about difficult decisions, but I'm assuming that the moral distress that all of you were having was that not being able to engage with, with the patients, having a massively rapid turnover of, of, of staff and patients and, and actually having a lot of death around you, to put it bluntly. Is that fair to say? So I think that's probably true. I mean, and I should be clear. So again, I, I spent a lot of the first wave really away from it. Uh, and, and when I came back to it, you know, um, for, for the second and third waves, um, uh, you know, I was mostly in my role supporting intensive care uh, as an anaesthetist doing the things that anaesthetists could do, intubating patients, resuscitating patients, turning patients. Um, but I, I did see it all. And here's the thing about intensive care it's all about the detail that's what we learned we learned that it's all about the detail it's all about attention to detail and you know if there's one thing that i learned in 22 years of of being a doctor and seeing intensive care was that there are no heroic gestures there there there's no you know it's not what you think you don't rock up with some vial of wonder drug and give it to someone and suddenly raise them from the dead it's about the care and the attention to detail and when you strip, well, I thought that's what you did. That was my yeah, no. years in ITU. I watched all those those programs. I saw all those and not Andrew Ma, the, the BBC News at six, where all of you were doing <laughs> heroic injections. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly it. But 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 you know the, the, what what intensive care is, and I think what's poorly understood about it because all people rarely see past the machines and past the you know and, and it's that whole thing of a life support machine the idea that there's a single solution to critical illness which is the life support machine is to take away what it truly is which is about intensity of care and that most of that care being delivered really by the nursing workforce yes um, I, I was going to ask you about nurses now there's nurses on this call and nurses of course uh i imagine a lot of the care in ITU is done by nurses and they do an incredible job and I imagine a lot of the nurses were also uh, having nurses predominantly child uh, carers of, of either children or or, care, or, or their, their elders back at home they've got multiplicity of, of roles plus they in a way have less uh, less flexibility than doctors I mean was your sense nurses was, was struggling more than the doctors or, or can you not say no I, I, 
I think that is both subjectively and obviously, uh, subjectively and objectively the case. Uh, and, and, you know, the surveys that we ran, we ran surveys in June across 700 clinicians from a number of different hospitals. And certainly there was marked injury in both doctors and nurses and other groups, but, but the main groups that we surveyed were doctors and nurses. And, and the nurses showed greater signs of, or, or, or reported a greater number of symptoms uh, associated with, with, with post-traumatic stress and depression and uh, anxiety than the doctors. So there is so much that we might learn from other organizations, including the military, but it's equally important to know where we are different from those organizations. And the military have, uh, the luxury is the wrong word, but the advantage that they bring people home from a deployment and then they bring them onto lighter duties for a longer period of time. And I'm not sure that we will be able to do that. So, so we need to think very hard about what we do instead. And, and uh, you know, I think that that looks like, uh, you know, as Simon said, you know, get, getting, getting the basics right is a bare minimum. Uh, and, and, you know, I was in a unit uh, in the last week where the coffee room was also the photocopier room was also the office and it was about three meters by two meters so you couldn't even distance in that room and yet that was where the staff was supposed to rest i mean get that stuff right uh get that investment right and invest in the people and 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 and, and you know just giving people and, and and there was a really telling comment from one of the nurses i spoke with who said you know, uh, I said, do you need extra staff? And, and, and she said, you know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take enough staff before, before you offer me extra staff. And so, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we can't be under any illusions about yeah. how root and branch we need to be about thinking about this. So, so we can't, the, you know, it would be great if we could all take a year off, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, uh, I've got my year booked. I haven't, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> would be great. I suspect a lot of people listening to this would love a year. Kevin, I know we've kept you beyond the time that you said we're waiting for, for Claire to come at six. Would you be happy to stay on till six? Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fine. yeah. We've, we've had another question, which is quite a long question, so I'll try and paraphrase it, but it's, and, but it's something I've heard you and others speak. We're increasingly asked, are we okay? And people are being honest about saying, well, I'm not really okay, actually. I think the, I think the narrative has changed. But what can we do? As, is there a way of then engaging the you know, people who say, I'm not an okay? And I know that, uh, and the question actually says, Professor Greenberg seems to suggest supervisors trained to proactively explore into psych psychological health should be part of, of what we put in place into, into hospitals, which would be very nice if we started to put in place a sort of psychologically minded uh, people. I mean, is that something that you on your travels around the country have, have picked up, that that's what people want? So I think one of the really interesting lessons to learn from COVID is that there is no one size fits all solution. And, and I've watched, you know, that, that, that where we were at our best in COVID in general was where we allowed local units to invent their own um, solutions to their local problems. So in some places I found fantastic examples where they had a brilliant relationship with an inward facing psychologist who became their rock and defense and some very movies and elsewhere it was other things um, and and you know softer measures and just uh you know in some places it was augmenting pay temporarily in some cases it was uh you know hot food coming in all of these things made big differences um i think one of the striking things that i learned from neil greenberg who i've worked with closely now neil and i are uh, mates of old but it's been kind of a great pleasure to, to rediscover him in, in this incident um uh, is that thing of breaking down the barriers and that thing of augmenting the value you get out of your primary therapeutic relationship, which is with your colleagues at work. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a huge amount there. I, I'm, and look, I, I should caveat all of this by saying I am not a mental health professional. No, but it, it's, it's a joy. It, I have to say someone that's been talking about this for the last 13, 14 years about having uh, this sort of debate it's a joy to hear an intensivist, an anaesthetist talking about this. It, it's a real joy because it means we've penetrated really far. By the way, Vanessa Cowie, you've raised your hand. We can't actually, you can't speak. Why don't you put the uh, 
question in the in the chat room and we'll try and get you onto it. But Kevin, it is a real joy that to get an anaesthetist doing a survey on the mental health of, of his, his own kind it, it is fabulous. But, but you know, that came from Neil as well. So, so before COVID, I was talking to him about his work and, and, uh, and partly in the context of the Helicopter Emergency Medical Service. And, you know, we go out to some fairly awful things and, and I began to wonder whether or not we were truly as okay as we thought we were. And he said this thing, he said, you know, with the HEM services, they're very protocol driven. And so you go in and the first thing you do, you get up there very early in the morning, you check the helicopter, you check your equipment, you check every piece of your equipment, you check the ventilator, you check the suction unit, and there's a protocol for doing that. And you check its battery is okay. And he said, the thing is that we do all of this and it's great. And it's a realization that we need to be assiduous about checking that our system works okay. But who does that for you? <laughs> when you walk in the moment, who checks that your battery is okay? Oh. Who checks that you're working out? Oh, I suspect that so many people on this call now have never had their batteries uh, checked at all. But, but, but I think that that failure to appreciate that, that, yeah. that we don't exist in a technological or a scientific system. We exist in a socio-technical, uh, uh, you know, socio-technical endeavour where the people are as important as the equipment that they use. And so we've been quite good at now, especially in anesthesia, we're quite good at checking our equipment. We recognize we're dependent upon it, but you got to check the people as well. And so that's why I, I you know, that's why I did that survey uh, because I think that, that it's very difficult to know if you're okay. And it's very difficult to know if you're alone in not being okay, if you can't see that. Absolutely. And there's somebody put a plug in and I must echo this that anaesthetists are actually very good at addressing their own mental health, uh, mainly not their own, but the organisations that look after anaesthetists, mainly because sadly, though anaesthetists have low levels of mental illness, they're very good at uh, sadly at killing themselves. They have one of the highest rates of suicide and the association of uh, the AAGBI Great Britain and the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland have done fabulous work looking at the well-being of anaesthetists. Uh, the other great, and I know probably none of nobody from this specialty, the Royal College of Obs and Gynae for the last three years have been running a, a, a whole working group looking at the well-being of their staff. So I think uh, I think it is I think it is changing, and I think when the likes of you uh, and Neil Greenberg, of course, has been saying this for years, I think it's. It is going to change, but that takes me on to probably what might be one of the last few questions to ask you. Do you, I mean, hopefully I'm not being naive. I, I get the feeling we're now on the, the home straight out of this terrible plague that we've all been in. In your experience, the, the, the mental health legacy of, of COVID on staff, what, what's your sense? So I, I think that the, so what, all you can do in the face of something awful like this is to, is is to look for how you can you know have some growth in the period after you know have a time to recover and respond and, and but then look for the opportunities for growth and for being you know for everything being perhaps better afterwards or improved somehow and for me I, you know, what I really want to do is to is to continue and expand the these sort of uh, surveys uh, to really give us a sort of a trend measure of how our workforce is doing and I, I think we should always have had this and I think we should have had this because yes. you know when we talk about the managerialism in healthcare it's necessary that it's there but no one ever no one ever really looks at what happens to the workforce when we reorganize the service and no. and is it truly better for everybody and so the legacy going forwards is that thing that, that I learned from Neil in the first place, which is let's check the batteries of our stuff on a regular basis and let's know when they're running low. There and, is a, sorry, carry on. Uh, and, and, um, and understand that it is a false dichotomy that we make when we say it's either the, we look after the staff or we look after the patients, which is so often the, the, yes. the, 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 it's so often the choice you're offered as a clinician, isn't it? that it's either Absolutely. you or the patient and, and, and in fact it, it, it should be we look after the staff so that they can do their best for the patients that's what we should be saying yes it's it's uh, i used to talk about when it was patient centered you don't have a, a, a baby centered it's a dyad between between the patient 
and the carer and you can't have a patient without a carer and you can't have a carer without a patient so it is a false dichotomy it's it's the system looks after somebody's R, so it's anonymous or a lot of these are anonymous unless they're named but they're a bit cynical really that nothing is actually going to change that so much effort is being put into the system now because we're still in the pandemic i might start off answering that and then ask you to to sum up what you think but from where i sit and having been in this space now for 14 years i've never known so much of this it we've had this time last year if we can before the pandemic we had every organization saying something needs to be done hee gmc nursing room referee council but nobody was doing anything and now it feels that everybody is doing something i mean is that your sense kevin yes it is um i i think partly because you know one of the positive side effects of the pandemic that we've been through has brought us together as a health service in a way that i don't think that i've seen since i've been at work uh, uh, that collectivism within the service is there you know you feel that you're part of something in a way that actually i, I think that has been less so uh, in previous years in the run-up um i think that that recognition that the ways that we work impact the ways that we feel and and our health our mental health our physical and mental health you know we've always known that but it's now impossible to ignore that yes and then finally that the, the other drop of realization is that this I, I think before covid much more so you know it, there was not a lot of wider recognition that the mental health and the psychological well-being of the workforce was anything other than being separate from and in fact to see it as an intrinsic part of the delivery of the service I think is the important penny drop moment for us. So yes, I'm steeply encouraged. And I think that we, we, we as a workforce are the difference and we, we, we make things happen. COVID has taught us that and we make this happen. Kevin, you are fabulous. I started off by saying that the first time I ever heard you speak, I was just amazed and you've been amazing this evening. And thank you very much for giving up your time because I know that like many people you're incredibly busy and you've probably got about a thousand emails to do there so I think though you won't hear the applause I think everybody can clap you and uh, we'll now move thank you very much Kevin thank we'll now you. move to Claire who's going to basically for the last uh, 15 minutes just tell us a little bit about the groups that are going to be done and Claire we've just had a, a, a lovely uh, debate with Kevin and some lovely questions about uh intensive care staff and what's going on if i can just introduce you you're a, a general practitioner and you've That's also right. uh you, you you're involved in this space in that you you're interested in mental health and of the workforce and you might want to say a little bit more uh, so the floor is yours for the next 15 minutes just to talk about the groups which are going to start in two weeks time that's correct. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I'd like to apologise for coming to the webinar a little bit late. Um, I've been in my GP surgery remotely consulting since eight o'clock and I've literally just finished. So I'm very sad to have missed Kevin doing his talk because I would have loved to have seen it. Um, yes, I'm here today um, representing Doctors Association UK um, because we've been working alongside doctors in distress. We recognise that the pandemic has had a huge toll on the mental health of all doctors, but in particular doctors that work in intensive care, um, because they have really been the people at the forefront of this pandemic and taken the brunt of um, a lot of the distressing things that have happened to our patients. Um, I work as a GP, but I used to be an anaesthetics trainee. I've worked in two different intensive cares. I um, have worked in both a DGH and a tertiary referral centre. So I understand the pressures that, um, that you get in intensive care and the working environment as well. Um, so um, in terms of going forward, um, oh, sorry, and actually just coming back to my own personal interest in mental health, I burnt out very quickly and very hard after becoming a GP um, and I've gone through a process of recovery. So I've been there and I know what it feels like to be burnt out and to have that initially that feeling of being emotionally overwhelmed and then moving into kind of disengagement and um, kind of feeling very flat and not being interested and losing 
or your, you know, your emotions. Um, it's a very difficult place to be. So I, I very much empathise with anyone that might particularly be in that situation at the moment. Um, so going forward, then doctors in distress um, are going to be planning to running uh, to run a series of support groups for doctors and nurses that work in intensive care. Um, and what they're planning to do is to run them at the same time over the next eight weeks. So the plan, I believe, is um, for them to start on uh, Tuesday, the 9th of March at quarter past five. So the same day and the same time as this particular webinar. And these sessions are going to be run by Zoom. have since previously for different groups um, so um, I believe that they have been run for people with long COVID and for um, black and minority ethnic professionals as well um, and they've had some really fantastic feedback um, from the people that have participated in these groups um, so they're really it's a really effective program and it gets fantastic feedback um, I know that they are very keen for as many people to join as possible. The groups will be small. I believe they're going to be a maximum of 20 in each group. So you'll get to know your facilitator. You'll get to know the people that you're with. Um, and um, they're very keen for as many people to join as possible. If you're interested in joining up, the links will be sent by email straight after this webinar. Um, and I think that the, they are quite keen for um, the people that are on the web webinar at the moment to use the chat box to let us know if there are any particular topics, if you're thinking of joining them, that um, you would like to discuss so that the facilitators can be briefed in advance of the, um, of the programme starting. Thank you, Claire. And there's some questions in the chat box. Yes, of course, they're open to anybody that works in intensive care. And you probably heard my ignorance from when I was interviewing Kevin. Uh, that the last time I was in intensive care, you know, I, I, it was so long ago, many of you weren't born. So it's for any staff that works in intensive care and just get hold of us at Doctors in Distress. And the, the groups, as, as Claire said, we hope, uh, this is the plan, and it may not happen, that they'll be what we call closed groups. It depends. In other words, after the first two, whoever's in there stays in there and nobody comes in after that, which means you can, over the course of that eight weeks, get to know each other and have a confidential space. If it is the case that that's impossible because of the way you all work, we may possibly have what's called open groups. So it will be a different group every, eight, every, every week. I hope it will be the same facilitator with the same group. That's our aim. And yes, we, we've worked, these aren't, they're not therapy groups, uh, but they're run by therapists. So they're run in a, in, a, in a safe, contained way. And if people are distressed and want more help, then we can direct them to practitioner health uh, for, for treatment, really. Claire, you're going to be part of these, aren't you? Um, I, not to my knowledge, but I'm oh. very happy to be part of them. Okay, <laughs> I, well, anyway. And Thank you very much. supporting them. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I might not be in the groups themselves. Lovely. And thank you so much for, for you uh, coming forward and being so honest and open about your own uh, issues. And yes, it must be incredibly hard uh, working from eight till, till, till now on, on, on the, on the uh, general practice, which is pretty tough. We'll be also be running groups for other uh, specialty groups so don't worry if you're not uh, an intensive care doctor in, in its widest sense are there any more questions that anybody has if so put them on our on our chat room i'm just going to ask Anne because i think we're going to ask people for questions about what they would like in terms of specific subjects is that right Anne? yes that's fine so i am Anne poor i'm chief exec of doctors in distress and thank you first of all to kevin thank you to our Claire, as we call her, because you do these for us all the time. And thank you to Claire Ashley. What we'd like participants to be thinking about is if you were joining these groups, are there any specific topics that you think you want us to cover so we can do topic specific uh, conversations and we could put on more webinars if that's what you wanted, but also what do you want from the groups themselves? And I think if you want to make it anonymous, you can always email me afterwards. Uh, very easy. And dot Paul at Doctors in Distress uh, or something onto our website. And we'd really, you know, we will endeavour to cover everybody's needs. It is but eight weeks, so we may well need to run this again. We found that with our other groups. So far, we haven't run a group and then not run it again so 
um, but it, it's about you and it's about what you need. So we need you to tell us. And as we said, it's uh, the groups are, are not therapy, but they're run along therapeutic grounds. What we won't be doing is sort of problem solving PowerPoint. It's not about that. It's about allowing you just to, to, to put what you've been experiencing and what Kevin has talked about so eloquently. And uh, you, as you see on the chat box, you can see our details, if not going to doctors in distress, but we will be getting back to you. So on that note, I just would like to thank all of you intensive care staff. You literally have been the epicenter of, I'm a GP, I'm biased. I think GPs are the best profession. And Kevin, I wish you'd become a GP and not a, an airline pilot or whatever you do. But other than that, the only true generalists, I think, are intensive care doctors because you have to deal with the totality of the patients as they present to you. And then you have to deal with the families concerns and then you have to deal with with the aftermath as as it happens as you've had so many deaths that you've had to deal with so i would just like to thank you so much uh, for all your hard work and i'm really hoping that we're now as i said on the home straight so on that note uh thank you we'll be in touch with you and have a good evening and have a glass of wine on me take care thank you